and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tyler Reed. I'm the Manufacturing Applications Manager here at Go Engineer. And today's topic is 3D printing and urethane plastics, the best of both worlds. So 3D printing and urethane plastics. First of all, what is polyurethane? It's a versatile plastic. It's typically a thermoset plastic, but it is available in thermoplastic uh, varieties. Uh, polyurethane is known for its wide variety of attributes. It can be flexible or rigid, clear or opaque. There's filled varieties as well. But it's known most especially for its wear resistance or abrasion resistance and its durability. Urethane is generally not 3D printed directly. The primary reason for that is uh, what I mentioned before. It's a thermoset in most varieties, meaning as you heat it up, it doesn't really soften and becomes harder. So most varieties of thermosets require a two-part curing process, the mixing of two base materials to achieve one cured polyurethane. There are machines out there that do print in polyurethane, but they print in the one variety of thermoplastic polyurethane that doesn't have all of the attributes that I mentioned before, the flexibility or the rigidity, the clear or opaqueness, etc. One of the great things about polyurethane is that the material characteristics are actually really desirable for many applications. Because of its wear and abrasion resistance in the rigid varieties and because of its tear resistance in the more flexible varieties, it's great for things like sprockets and rollers, any sorts of parts that are going to come into contact with each other other plastics, other metals. So we see polyurethanes used a lot in components for assembly machinery and other industrial applications. So where does 3D printing come into play on the polyurethanes? I believe that 3D printing and two-part polyurethanes are actually very complementary. The 3D printing provides unlimited design freedom and easy geometry creation. You know, 3D printing, we can create, for example, molds very easily. Polyurethane offers material properties kind of above and beyond what we can achieve in printing. So we can use these two technologies together. We can use them together in really one of two ways. We could have our goal to be in uh, a 3D printed part or end part we want printed. We can use polyurethane in that case by either coating or filling our 3D printed part to strengthen or stiffen that part. So to give you an example, we can print in ABS, nylon, Ultem. These are all materials that have tensile strengths, you know, under 70 megapascals, where as a moderate urethane has a, a starting strength of about 70 pascals, so megapascals. So if we can combine the two and sort of make a composite or an alloy uh, plastic, we can get uh, a higher strength part almost for free. Polyurethane can also provide added functionality, so it can add additional tear or abrasion resistance or impact resistance or even chemical resistance to a 3D printed part. And in some cases, we might want to create overmolds or soft touch surfaces with some flexible polyurethanes on parts that were printed on, say, an FDM machine, where we don't have the ability to simulate an overmold directly. In the second case, we might want a cast urethane part as our end goal. So how do we use 3D printing in that regard? Well, we can 3D print molds directly. That's the easiest, most direct way to create urethane parts is to print the mold and then fill that mold with a two-part urethane. Those molds, depending on what machine they come off of and our requirements for surface finish, they may be post-processed or used as is. And one of the unique situations that I experimented with is the creation of water-soluble molds. So sort of one-time use molds that would create trap geometry and allow us to create very complex parts out of a single casting. This is something you couldn't do before, and so I kind of experimented with that, and we'll see some examples here later on. Another way that we can use 3D printing for a cast urethane part is to print a pattern and then create a silicone mold off that pattern. And this is going to be very similar to the traditional method of creating cast urethane parts using soft, pliable silicone molds filled with a two-part resin. But the idea here is that we're printing the patterns instead of machining them or, or handcrafting them. So we're going to go over some examples here. But first, I wanted to kind of explain the setup that I used. Now, for these examples, I did them in my workshop. 
but I want you to be aware that there are several different companies out there that are using 3D printing alongside their cast urethane technologies to do this on a, a more industrial level to give you uh, stronger parts, more fully dense parts, more dimensionally accurate parts. One example of a company that's doing it extremely well is Solid Concepts. They have a whole division of their business dedicated to urethane casting. But I wanted to do it myself, and so I got probably about $500 worth of equipment here, and it's going to set me up very well to create almost fully dense parts. To give you an overview of what I needed, on the left I have a vacuum pump. That's a two-stage 5 CFM vacuum pump, which is a little bit overkill for what I need. That's connected to a vacuum chamber. And that chamber is the cooking pot looking device there. I have a pressure pot. So the opposite of vacuum, we have a pressure pot. Really, I have a modified paint pressure pot. And then we have some accessories like mold release, resin colorant, and then some resins and a scale is important as well. So the first part I did was a press break die. Press break die is a part that is going to see some compressive forces. The, the amount of force that we would see depends really on the thickness and of the material and the material type. This particular die shape is used to create 90 degree angles close to each other. And it has a cantilevered arm on here that's going to see uh, quite a bit of bending force on it. So my idea here was to not really change the design at all, but print it sparsely and then fill it with a urethane plastic. And that gave me added capabilities. I haven't fully tested the limits of this part, but I can say for sure that it is more stiff and it's more rigid. And it came at the cost of a couple dollars worth of resin. So that's the most basic uh, resin filled part. The next example here is of my soluble mold. So we're looking at a cutaway of the mold that I created. It's of a coil shape that coils down and then wraps under the coil and then back up the center. So this is inside SolidWorks. We're looking at an internal void in a cylindrical part. What I did was I printed that cylindrical part out of the, our support material. On the Fortis 250 and above on the FDM machines, we can choose to print in support material only. Now, one of the keys here in my design is I had to create the profile of this coil as a square. And that means I had four walls that were 90 degrees apart. And as this was moving up in Z, our walls were self-supporting. That was incredibly important because if I had created a shape that wasn't self-supporting in on the inside, then the software would have needed to create support material on the inside and we wouldn't have had an empty void. So that's one caveat here. But what you're looking at, this is after it's been printed and I've started to fill the coil. I started to fill it with a Shore 95 urethane. And that's the yellow urethane, but I ran out of material. So I moved to the green material, and that's a Shore 85 urethane. So they're almost the same material here. And I just filled that with a syringe, so nothing too spectacular. You can see the underside of the part. I printed sparse, and you can see we've got what looks appears to be a full fill. So I let that cure overnight in the pressure pot. Here's a picture after it cured. You can see how the pressure pot which I pressurized at about 40 PSI, really push the material down into the cavities. And that makes, makes it so if there are any air bubbles left in the resin, they become smaller. So we get a near fully dense part. So after that was cured and looked like the last photo, I popped it in our tank for a couple hours and let the tank do its work. And the mold dissolved away and I ended up with this shape here. You can see I've got the rigid, green that's fully cured and the yellow is not quite fully cured because that resin was a longer curing resin so it's a little bit softer but this shape is too complex really to create in a single go using traditional methods and i was able to create it just in a one-step process so i haven't come up with a lot of applications for this yet because i really just had the idea but i'm thinking maybe if we could use like a thermally conductive resin, then we might be able to create three-dimensional electrical traces or something along those lines. The next example here, it's a robot gripper. And this idea and this project came out of Yale University. It's part of what they call the Open Hand Project. It's an open source project looking to optimize the design of an under-articulated arm or finger. 
And they did some research into the composite parts, so 3D printed parts, in this case ABS, backfilled with polyurethane and also epoxy resins. And they did some studies as to if they were to shell out the interior or to create some ribbed interiors like you see along the right hand side there and then fill those with a urethane, how does that affect the strength? I decided to print those parts myself. I, I pulled these files off the Open Hand website and these files have a couple cool things going on with them. These files, you notice that they have basically three segments of the finger. Between each segment is intended to be a flexible joint. And then on the two end segments, you have a space that's intended to be a pad. And that pad's supposed to be durable, tear resistant, abrasion resistant pads. Printed inside this part are essentially tiny molds. So around those joints and around those pads, we have very thin walls of plastic. What we're going to do is fill those cavities with uh, a Shore 30 polyurethane for the flexible joints and a Shore 95 polyurethane for the rubber pads, and then we'll cut away the mold walls after they've cured. So we've designed extra functionality into the 3D printed part because we get that extra uh, functionality almost for free in terms of the manufacturing process. So you can see at this point here, I've filled the joints with the Shore 30 urethane and I'm about to fill the rubber pads. I'm using some compounds from a company called Smooth On. Smooth On has a wide variety of urethane plastics. I wouldn't say that they have the best prices, but they have the best availability, so they're easy to get a hold of. I have, I believe, two pounds of resin here, and it's a that's a trial size. It runs about $30, so it's it's not too expensive to get into. I wanted to show a picture of the resin before and after vacuum degassing. Vacuum degassing is uh, the reason why I had the vacuum pump in the vacuum chamber. When I mix the two resins together, I create air bubbles as I'm mixing them together. Uh, in this case, I'm mixing them in a plastic cup. Once they're mixed together, I place that cup in the vacuum chamber, pull a full vacuum on it, which takes about 10 to 20 seconds, and the air bubbles start to pull out of the resin. So this whole process takes no longer than a minute. And after a minute, you end up with a resin mixture on that looks like something on the right with little to no air bubbles at all. And that's gonna give you a much better casting. That's an essential step for urethane casting. So here's a close-up shot of the, the joints and the pads filled. You can see that I've overfilled them a little bit and that's because I really want to make sure that I get a full fill and then I'll just use a razor blade to trim them back after they cure. This is how they look before I cover the top of the pressure chamber. So once I have the cavities filled, I'm going to pop them in the pressure chamber and pressurize that chamber to 40 or 50 PSI and let it sit for the duration of the cure. And this is what the parts look like post curing and post trimming. So you can see I have some flexible areas that are free to move. I have some pads that are going to be a lot more abrasion resistant than even the nylon that I use to trim away. Those pads and the joints both have locking mechanisms built in, so the parts are not going to separate or delaminate from each other. It's actually a really clever way of designing parts. Here's a look at the parts uh, the sort of the flexibility of the parts you can see that shore 30 is extremely flexible i'm putting little to no pressure on these and you can see the registration uh, features inside that rubber pad you can also see that there's no air bubbles or voids in the rubber pads again that's a testament to the steps taken prior to curing the vacuum degassing and the pressure curing so the last example i had I wanted to do another project using the soft urethanes. Really what I wanted is I have these blender bottles all around my house and I'm always carrying them in my hands and I really wanted a way to hook it to my bag using a carabiner or something like that. So I was gonna create a strap. I started by using our 3D scanners. In this case, it was a HandyScan 700 from Creaform. To scan the bottle, that took uh, a couple minutes. From that scan, I just pulled the revolve shape and brought that into SOLIDWORKS. 
and that was going to give me an, an accurate enough starting point. And then I designed this strap here that's intended to give me a hook area for a carabiner. From that design, I created a three-part mold, which you can see here. It's got an upper cavity, a lower core, and then an insert to create that loop. And then I printed those in our Vero clear material on an Object 30 Prime. So you can see these are right off the machine. Essentially, I have cleaned out the support material where it was needed. There was very little support material needed, but there was some. On the, I should say, on the part on the left, which was printed in a gloss. The part on the right was printed in a matte surface finish. And I did a matte surface finish, so that would give me a more uniform surface finish. The matte surface finish is created by completely coating the part in support material. And that's all cleaned away. One of the interesting things is the difference in color here. You can see uh, both of these are the same material. They were printed at the same time, yet they're two very different colors. That's because that support material that was on the right side, right hand part, creating the matte finish, actually created a barrier around that part and prevented it from kind of excessive UV rays. I can achieve that same look on the gloss part by doing what we call like a, a post bleaching. Basically just sticking that part underneath the fluorescent light for a few hours, I can achieve that same level of clarity. Just something kind of interesting there. So here's the setup. These uh, two parts bolted together, ready to go. We're using Vitaflex 30, which is a Shure 30 urethane. I'm using the So Strong colorant. Just literally one drip of colorant is more than what you need to create a colored part. And uh, the universal mold release. I I made sure to coat all of these parts excessively with mold release. So after I mixed those resins together and it did, went through the same vacuum degassing step, it was time to fill them up. I used just a little 10 ml syringe filled from the top. One of the nice things about using the clear materials is that I can see how far along the process I am for filling these molds and if I have any voids and, and how much more material I really need to be at. That's something that was uh, really invaluable for this process. Kind of a cool close-up shot there. You can see that there's no voids, no bubbles. So after that went into the pressure pot and cured overnight, I was able to pull the parts out. I used enough mold release that uh, didn't really have any issues there. You can see the strap on the bottle up in the upper left-hand corner. We got a close-up of the strap. So you can see the pretty fine details. There's geometry details in this strap that would be difficult to create if we had machined that mold, namely the text on the outside of the strap. That text is normal to the face. It comes straight out. There's little to no draft on that. And that's something that's trivial to do on the printer, but extremely difficult to do in the CNC process. There was down, one downside to this part. I, I didn't quite fill this part all the way. So you can see at my injection point, I did have two little materials. So this was sort of a <laughs> almost failed attempt. I'm, I'm going to fill that spot and uh, this part should be good to go. But you know, I, overall, I was really happy with how easy this process was. The time that it took from scanning a part to creating the geometry inside SolidWorks, printing the mold and running the parts was less than 36 hours is about a day and a half total time and that's about it for this webinar it's a short and sweet webinar it's covering a topic that i think is familiar to a lot of people but the concept of using the machines to directly print the molds i think is foreign and also using the machines to print master patterns for silicone molds i didn't do any examples of those mostly because the process is just so similar to what's already being done out there i would definitely say if you want to see more detailed information or if you want to see this done on a, a more refined scale that's not do it yourself check out solid concepts website Right? They do it extremely well, and they have all sorts of different capabilities in terms of dimensional accuracy, size of parts, and materials, and inserts, and everything else. So thank you for watching. Again, go ahead and check out our YouTube page and watch the rest of our videos here. If you'd like a copy of these slides, or if you have more questions, feel free to comment in the YouTube comments, or shoot me an email directly. Thank you. Thank you.